Welcome. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much, um, Pete and, and Brett, for the, the you know, terrific organization of this of this meeting. And it's great to be here and have the opportunity to speak. I just came in from Houston and uh, realized that the uh, the weather here is is quite cold. Uh, <laughs> and um, so. And it's just getting better. That's right. <laughs> so what I was going to talk about today is the process of quality assurance and, and low-dose rate prostate brachytherapy. We've asked to dim the lights a little bit. A lot of what I'm going to show is going to be on some images and really to walk you through some process um, that we've aimed to do at, uh, at MD Anderson and would like to then help bring that out into the community setting, especially when we start talking about MRI. And I heard the last speakers talking about MRI, and it is, it is a complicated area only in the sense of the sequences and access, but from a quality assurance standpoint, it is, there's nothing better that you can use out there in your practice. It gives you significant feedback about how you're doing your implants, and it provides you information if you need to take the patient back to put a few more seeds in, or it provides information to improve your next implant. Without it, you're operating a little bit in the blind, actually a lot in the blind, and I'll show you the consequences of that when you operate in the blind. Now, all that being said, you've got to be very proficient at being able to use ultrasound. Ultrasound is your DRR that you're going to be using. If you are going to be doing implants, you need to be proficient and, uh, and very good at using ultrasound. And the the workshops today are going to give you, with phantoms, our simulation process mechanism to help you in that. In that. So with that disclosures, um, here are my disclosures. Probably the most relevant disclosure is uh, C4 imaging. Um, this is technology that we spun out of some technology as a quality assurance tools that were developed at MD Anderson in order to localize um, uh, radioactive seeds under MRI so that you can do accurate post-implant assessment. Um, that technology is all FDA approved. I will not discuss any technology that is non-FDA approved. So when we look at uh, prostate, um, and I'm not sure how much was discussed on the MRI side, but when we look at it, here you can see um, the anatomy, and you can see the anatomy very clearly. Let's see if I can, uh, is this a pointer? So. Um, this is the uh, some anatomy of the prostate, and I bring this anatomy because I think it's a very, it highlights a critical element. Um, you can see the prostate nicely. Many of my residents, when they first contour the prostate under MRI, they will outline what's in dark right here. Okay? Can't see it. So they'll outline, this is the prostate. And much of what they will not outline is the, um, is the peripheral zone on MRI. And so you can see here, this is all peripheral zone. 90% of the prostate is, cancer is located in the peripheral zone, um, which is important to know, especially when you're, when you're doing your uh, planning. This right here is your urethra. So what is the distance of that urethra from the anterior wall of the rectum? Anybody want to guess? It's about three millimeters in this, in this patient. So even though it looks large up on the screen, the distance from the urethra to the anterior wall of the rectum is about three millimeters. The consequences of that, we know from biopsying and patients getting septic, we also know that if you develop an anterior ulcer on that rectal wall, you don't want your gastroenterologist to go in there and start biopsying it, thinking that it might be prostate, I mean, uh, 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 rectal cancer, because that can result in a fistula which is the worst possible complication that can then require a colostomy. So having this information and being able to visualize where the urethra is on planning, during the implant, and on post-implant assessment is very critical to help minimize urinary um, morbidity. Here you can see on the MRI, you can see uh, the ejaculatory ducts nicely. You can see them coming into the Vera Montana here, and this is in a coronal image. You can see here at the apex, this structure right here is the external urinary sphincter. And in the center of the urinary sphincter is the actual urethra. Um, and I'll try to highlight that, which is actually right here. 
But this is a one centimeter diameter structure that's on all males. And, in, and at the GU diaphragm, it universally is right at the center or in, the, in that G row or, or D row, depending on which side of the template you use to do your implants. And why is that important? It's important because the external sphincter does not need to be implanted. Under ultrasound, this external sphincter will look like prostate. You cannot differentiate the sphincter itself from prostate. And so if you implant into this, the patient will have a lot of urinary obstructive symptoms. And we see these commonly. And also, they can get a bulbal membranous uh, stricture at the uh, edge of the urethra. So external urinary sphincter, very important structure. Uh, we published on that and demonstrated some of the increased morbidity through looking at it on MRI planning. Um, establishing a high quality brachytherapy program, um, you, you're all going to go through this to, uh, over the course of this weekend, which is going to be utilizing phantoms in order to learn how to appropriately utilize and operate your ultrasound. And that is going to be really critical as you move forward with your program. And that's true whether you're doing HDR or LDR. So I broke this down for on the process, looking at simulation similar to the way that you would think about simulation for external beam radiation. So with ultrasound, that is your simulation tool if you're doing ultrasound-based planning. Um, the most important element, regardless of whether you're doing, is that you have to know where your base is. And you have to know where that base is in the sagittal plane of imaging. If you're just using axial imaging to identify your base, you are going to have poor quality implants. A couple of things can happen. One, you'll over implant the bladder neck, which doesn't need to be implanted. You'll under implant the bladder um, um, base, or you'll be sticking seeds into the, um, into the bladder and depositing seeds in there. None of which is necessary. If you use sagittal imaging to identify your base, you will do consistent high quality implants every time. In the simulation, we transfer these DICOM images from the ultrasound to the treatment planning system. Um, and then we take these one additional slice superior and then one additional slice inferior to the base. The ultimate equation that when you capture these images is that two times the length plus three should be the number of slices that you'll collect during that ultrasound simulation. Here's what that looks like. Um, from the, this is the, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you would see the bladder. Then the first next slice is going to be to your right will be the, um, the base slice. And then it'll move two more over all the way to the um, apex, which is the lowest right corner. So as you can see in that apical slide, or you cannot see, um, identifying that apex and even localizing the base very well can be challenging. Uh, from a template grid, we space that at 0.5 millimeters. Um, this is what your template grid pattern will look like. And what I'm showing right here as the apex in the center, I mean, at the apex here, you've got the head of the pubic rectalis muscle with the um, external sphincter and looking in front. And imagine this image compared to what I was showing before, which is this image. So we've moved toward MRI simulation, um, and it allows you to more accurately localize all of the tissue. But if you do not, are not using it, and you're going to use MR, I mean, ultrasound simulation, you need to really be aware of what that anatomical space looks like at the GU diaphragm. Um, template registration, ensure that your templates match, because when you pull in the image on the, on the um, ultrasound, what you see here in white and as A through M and 0 through 12. That represents the images that are captured on the ultrasound. It's pulled into the treatment planning system, and then you register, and what you're seeing on the screen is in red. That is your co-registration image for ultrasound. Now, that's important to know because if you misregister that template, that's going to affect what your plan looks like um, and when, you go to, uh, when you finish your planning. So check that the templates match, check that the computer program a template, white is imported from the ultrasound. You may need to drag the template onto the ultrasound image and align the letters and numbers. I've walked into the operating room and seen a case where the numbers were completely misaligned from the ultrasound to the template with the expectation that they would automatically align when you pulled it into the treatment planning system. 
Just be aware, this is an error that you can avoid. So then we move to ultrasound contouring. Ultrasound contouring, um, we've typically used a PTV margin, um, three millimeters laterally, anteriorly, zero millimeters posteriorly, and then five millimeters from apex to, uh, to base. Um, we've changed that to three millimeters over time. Here is the PTV. Here you can start seeing in blue represents the prostate volume at the base. Now we get to mid gland. You can see the prostate uh, with no margin posteriorly. The rectum is right underneath. And then we have uh, three millimeters um, laterally and anteriorly. Uh, here we are at the, at the apex. And again, I've circled this as, a, as prostate um, as well as you can start seeing the, uh, the PTV around it. But that is very difficult to distinguish whether that's actually a prostate or whether that's just the external urinary sphincter. And then here's one additional slice, a half centimeter inferior to the apex. In the 2D view, this is what you're going to see. Um, you see these, uh, minim these uh, images. Um, on the upper right is your ultrasound and axial, and then your sagittal and coronal. Uh, those are interpolated images. You really can't see any anatomy on the ultrasound in the sagittal and coronal, but you'll be able to distinguish the, uh, the, the isodose lines. In 2017, we put out a, a special edition. Um, Dr. Murtada and myself were, were guest editors and given the opportunity, and we actually looked at MRI-assisted radiosurgery and how to initiate MRI at every step of the quality assurance process. There's about 16 articles in this, much of which we'll discuss in here um, and run through that. So really, we looked at aiming to bend the slope of the brachy curve with MRI-assisted radiosurgery for the treatment of, of prostate cancer. And then we looked at util utilizing MRI. There's a, an article in there that talks about knowledge gaps, technical challenges, and barriers to implementation. It's a nice way to align and understand the language of MRI if you're new to that space. It is a different language. The T1, the T2 sequences, the cis sequences, um, whether, it's T, uh, whether it's a 3T or a 1.5, whether you have susceptibility artifacts, all of these type of common things are not, you, are not consistent with our common vernacular. But in the MRI space, it's important to know because it will affect how you decide on what type of images you use to plan and evaluate your patient. Uh, there is a, a nice uh, diagram that shows you can see the intraprosthetic dominant lesion. By then looking at the dominant lesion, you can then affect a V200 on that dominant lesion and maximize, um, and then you can walk through every step of the QA process. The clinical use of MRI across the prostate brachytherapy workflow, um, Dr. Blanchard uh, published on this, and what we looked, what we showed is the ultrasound or the MRI simulation process is a little bit different. Uh, that MRI simulation process and treatment planning is you do not have a gradical on your MRI when it's imported into the treatment planning system. So you have to take that in consideration, and we've come up with some methodologies to do so. So for MRI uh, simulation, you've got the image acquisition. Then you do template registration. The way you do template registration is you look at the base with the sagittal imaging, mid-gland, axial imaging, uh, the treatment planning on the posterior row, and I'll show more about that. And then on the, on the axial imaging, you ensure that it's midline in the G row or the D row, depending on which side of the, temp the template grid, uh, for your external urinary sphincter. Um, when you're going in your implant, the patient's going to be in the dorsal lithotomy position. However, when you get to capture the MR image, the patient's legs are down. So there needs to be a consideration of how you're going to do the simulation in, and this is a virtual simulation inside the treatment planning system when you are using MRI. So the best way to think about that is that the base of the prostate is not going to move when you elevate the patient's legs in the dorsal lithotomy position. However, the apex does, and the apex will elevate roughly between five to 10 millimeters. And so depending on the length of the prostate, which can range from three to 4.5, uh, centimeters, or you can then do a calculation, and that calculation represents the angle by which you would adjust your virtual probe during your simulation so that when you get into the operating room, you can align that consistent with what you're seeing in the operating room. Um, here you can see 
The, uh, this is a, the images that are then brought in to the treatment planning system. Um, here, these images are captured at 1.2 millimeter cuts from the uh, apex to the base, and you can see um, the anatomical frame framework nicely. I just blew it up right here. This is the prostate. Here's the mid gland. Here is the prostate looks like in the coronal, and here in the sagittal. When you bring it in to the treatment planning system, um, you then have additional uh, screen. We then highlight brachytherapy, pre-op, and prostate. Uh, this is uh, specifically to MIM, but I have no financial interest in MIM or any other. Um, but I just wanted to illustrate the mechanism in which we do this. This is the first planning screen you can see right here. This um, represents a, vir a virtual probe. This is right here. And this is what you're then going to, on the screen, you'll have this and you'll have the um, template grid in front of you. We then take that and, and you can see here the virtual probe. We then align that to a minus seven degrees. Um, then that allows for the template to be aligned. We then angle that virtual probe. You can see here, you click and drag it. You don't want to drag it the opposite way. If you, it always needs to go counterclockwise. If you do the probe angle clockwise, it's going to change the configuration of what your strands are going to be, and it's not going to be consistent with what it's going to be looking like in the operating room. So the angle of the probe is measured. You shift. Um, apex is further from the probe with legs up, and the length of the prostate gland is measured on MRI. So here you have the references. You want to make sure here the blue there's a, there's a little area you want to make sure that you know where your base is. So just like on ultrasound, you've got to be able to define your base. You equally have to be able to define your base on the MRI. And that MRI line right is right here. Here is what the base of the prostate looks like. We then align the grid. Um, this is a semen standard grid, grid location of 0.5 millimeter spacing. The G column is the center of the EUS. And the posterior of the prostate is, is placed between rows one and two. That way, when you get in the operating room and you go ahead to position the patient, you can just make sure it's aligned with the template grid on rows one and two, between rows one and two, and the apex and the G row. Uh, here we go ahead and uh, we've established, we've aligned. You can see a little bit of movement. You can move the grid as you need to. And this can be done by the physicist. I typically do this myself when I'm planning the cases. The decimeters can do this as well. And then the MRI simulation process is complete. One of the things that we've also utilized is, as we've been utilizing, is a coil. This is an in vivo coil. Um, this coil is an MR coil that is consistent with the same diameter as the ultrasound probe. However, recently, CMS has come into our institution and looked at the way that we've been doing infection control. And they basically have shut down our high-level disinfectant at MD Anderson and, um, and high-level disinfectant across many hospitals in the country are being frowned upon. The issue with that is that in these particular instructions for use for this type of a probe, it requires Cydex, which is a high-level disinfectant, in order to use it. So therefore, if the, your hospital is utilizing uh, any type of endorectal coils or specific ultrasound probes, the instructions for use are going to be critical for disinfectant. And if you don't know what your particular um, in infection control mechanisms are, that's going to come around because it's happening in our institution. We've had to change all of our processes over the last four months. Um, and one of those processes that have changed is we don't use the coil anymore. So now all the simulation and evaluation is done without this coil. However, if in your hospital you do have Cydex and you are allowed to utilize these, uh, these processes, the in vivo coil is an outstanding mechanism to use for simulation because then it can, um, more, it can give you very good images and align to what you're seeing in the operating room with ultrasound. MR contouring. Um, here, it's, you know, with MRI, it's, it takes about five to 10 minutes to actually contour all of the different structures. It's very easy to see the prostate, to see the apex, to see the base, and also to see some of the lip posteriorly as well as the external sphincter. Here you can see um, in the sagittal coronal and the axial view, 
This is a 3D T2 sequence that we bring in. It's standardized on all uh, MRI machines, whether it's a Philips, Siemens, or GE. A 3D T2 sequence is a optimal sequence to be using. Here you can see, here's the prostate. And then what's interesting is that there's a, what we've identified is a lip of prostate that comes up underneath the external urinary sphincter on a lot of men. So even at the apex, you can see here, there is some, some prostatic tissue. The urologists have known this for a long time because what they try to do is peel that back and they try to preserve the external urinary sphincter length as long as possible to maintain patient's continence. But it's, sometimes it's very difficult to do, especially when you have this lip of prostate tissue at the uh, posterior uh, um, apex. Here you can see that. Here's the, uh, the rectum. And then we move with the PTV. What I'm using on MRI for PTV margins has decreased from three millimeters down to one millimeter. Um, and that's anterior, superior, uh, and inferior, right and left laterally uh, using two millimeters. Uh, and here you can see the light blue represents the PTV on top of the prostate. For MRI planning, the structure, build the base is the key. Build in 0.5 centimeter from the base, minimize heterogeneity along the urethra, and then avoid needle placement anterior to the urethra. If you place a needle anterior to the urethra, that is gonna go through the penile urethra. And uh, it causes unnecessary trauma, bleeding, um, and it can completely be avoided. So don't place needles anterior to the urethra during your planning. Additionally, use activity per volume nomogram for QA. I saw in the last speaker, this is really critical because if you're prescribing, let's say iodine at 144 gray, you can do the one, here's the, this is the key for brachytherapy. You can use whatever activity you want to use. And the danger of, of activity per volume is that if you don't use a nomogram to verify it, you may be five to six to seven mill, you know, millicuries over your activity or under your activity. And so utilizing published nomograms is very helpful and they are out there and it's a great QA check and we do it on every one of ours to make sure that our volume and the activity per volume is aligned. In fact, we just have a publication that's coming out uh, from Mars specifically that one of our residents wrote up on all of the, uh, uh, on all, and you're actually activity per volume is a little bit less than it is with ultrasound and CT-based planning. So then you send these uh, I, uh, I, um, items into the, uh, into the treatment planning system. Here's 125 gray. You can see the air kerma strength that we use is 2.457. That's consistent with 1.9 millicurie. In a boost scenario with 90 uh, to 100 gray, we typically use 1.5 millicurie. Um, here we use a seed spacer algorithm for strands for loading. And this is actually a seed marker. The MRI marker is placed between the seeds so they can localize accurately exactly where you've placed the seeds under MRI. Here we start loading at the base, posterior, and then we move anterior. You can see here just by placing one, all of a sudden on, um, below that, down here, this represents the strand that you're looking at. Here's the, here's the strand, this is a seed, marker, seed, marker, seed, and then that's when you push here so it, it just loads it off for you right off the bat. So it's very easy in your treatment planning. And I, I, do, my, I do all my own uh, treatment planning, um, but of course you can have, you know, there's opportunities to have your physicist or symmetrist do that as well. You start placing, you know, the additional needles, seed spacer, and it automatically loads for you. You do it the next row, next row, and then two up. And so here is the base of the uh, prostate. The next is the one half centimeter back. We adjust and put the strands in five millimeter increments. Um, and this is a modified uniform loaded technique. And it's modified uniform load because we start removing the periurethral seeds to minimize heterogeneity along the urethra. And then you can start seeing those four seeds that have been removed at the center of the, of the planning process. And then here we are at the apex. You can see the external urinary sphincter at the center. It's at, again, that one centimeter diameter structure. And you have a deflection tool that you can move the strands laterally um, to avoid implanting these strands at the, at the apex of the, um, of the prostate. 
and then you can see that here. You can then look at your, uh, your DVH parameters, the V100 at 98%, V150 at 65%, V200 at 27%. Uh, the R100, you want uh, less than one cc. Um, that's very important to minimize the risk of rectal bleeding. And then the V200 we use for the external urinary sphincter is zero uh, c uh, cc's. Here's what the plan looks like. You can see right here, here's all the strands, and you can see at F6 and H6 um, the, uh, the needle loading. Here's your cumulative DVH. Here's what the plan looks like. You can see in the G row, I put this in here because I want to illustrate that you can put a needle in the G row below the urethra. That's fine. You just don't want to do it because that, that will not go through the, uh, the um, urethra. And then here's what the, what the isodotes lines look like um, for you. From the ultrasound implant, the implant technique um, is there's five different approaches to your implant technique. Number one is setup. Number two is needle insertion. You have to, uh, and you'll, look, you'll start working with needle handling and mid-gland mid insertion to the treatment plan location. Then we call it pre-deployment. The next phase is taking that needle from where you've inserted it based on the plan and you take it to its final resting spot. Then the seed deployment phase is removing the plug and then advancing the needle over the stylet so that the strand comes out. And then you've got the needle extraction phase. So this is a five-step process we teach our residents. It's nice to be able to think of each of these in each unique process to ensure that as you are moving forward, you are able to communicate to your urologist at every step of that process. What I typically do with our urologist, when uh, and I've worked with David Swanson, who was a former chair of urology at MD Anderson, we did virtually every implant together uh, for the first uh, 10 years before he uh, unfortunately passed away. But in our methodology, we work together on needle insertion, um, pre-deployment, and did the deployment together, and then extracted it. Now, we also are now doing implants because our volume has increased without the urologist in the operating room. So you have to be familiar with how to do this at every step of the process, knowing that your urologist is there, and also at times that urologist may not be there. Uh, implant assessment, image acquisition with MRI, uh, CT is currently standard as, um, with MRI and CT, contouring with MRI, and then dosimetry with quality of the implant. In that quality assessment, the first question is, do I need to take the patient back to the operating room? If the answer is no, that's terrific. The next question is, does a patient need to come back to the clinic in 30 days to repeat that assessment? And then the final question is, what have I learned from this implant that I can do to improve my next implant? So an MRI assessment, you can see here, you've got the seeds that are dark, the MRI markers that are between the seeds, the seed, and then the MRI marker. This is just to illustrate how the dosimetrist or the physicist can go in and localize and place these seeds to ensure that accurate post-implant assessment is performed. Here you can start seeing in the middle one that there's three, that just represents the periurethral strand where we have one seat at the base and one seat at the apex. Uh, here's what it looks like in the, in the sagittal plane, I'm sorry, the axial plane toward the apex. And then finally, here is the full MRI um, Mars LDR workflow um, that you can see right here. What we want to make sure that never happens again is this. This is the VA incident with poor quality assurance in the ultrasound CT-based era. And while many of us who have done thousands of implants will say, you know, you don't need to utilize MRI. MRI can help make sure that this never happens again. And we have the tools, we have the infrastructure to, uh, to do this. It'll eliminate a lot of the uncertainty as you build your practices. So with that, here is the, uh, here's the addition that if you have interest uh, within your practice and wanna thank you for your attention.